Hey, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us tonight. And I'd like to introduce our presenter for tonight's um, event, Elaine Emery. Elaine is a diabetes educator for Covenant Health System and has been doing so since 1990. She has been nationally certified since 1992. Um, she is also a proud alumni. She received her master's degree from LCU in nursing in, in 2011. And she is also a member of our Nursing Alumni Association. Following Elaine's presentation, Dr. Laurel Littlefield, who is the assistant um, professor of the Department of Exercise Science, will provide the invited response. And I'd like to remind everyone that all, the, the, all programs will be posted for viewing on the LCU Center of Excellence page following the program. So if we could please um, welcome Elaine Emery. Let me get all turned on here. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, I want a raise of hands. How many in here are nurses? Okay. And how many are bedside nurses? Okay. Great, 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 great. Because uh, this will really impact you all at the bedside. Um, you know, especially. So, how many of you are familiar with basal bolus? Okay, great, great. And most of us are familiar with sliding scale, right? Okay. Well, I worked on this project initially in my master's program in 2010, 9 and 10. And here it is, 2014, and we're still moving that direction. Things are slow, but hopefully one day, our hospital system will adapt to the standard now of a basal bolus instead of relying on sliding scale. So let me go ahead and, and go, get on into this and we'll talk, especially those of y'all that aren't familiar with the topic, we'll get more into some of the definitions here shortly. So when we started out, after I graduated, we, there was a team of us that met, there was a common interest and I met Dr. Ike, he's one of our uh, champions, I guess you can call him. He's a uh, hospitalist. And uh, so we, we met with um, a, a multidisciplinary group of nurses and had a dietitian and a pharmacist about how can we get this started up and going. And um, so this is still kind of a concept that is sort of still new uh, for the outpatient world. It's not so, I mean, for the inpatient world. It's not so much for the outpatient world, but that's just the way that that you treat people who have diabetes, especially type 1, using the basal bolus concept. But in the inpatient side, it's kind of a whole nother world. And uh, so we wondered, do we even have a problem before we really tackle and get groups together to figure out how to best solve our, our issue of improving glucose management? So what we wanted to do was look at evaluating the, the efficacy of what we are currently doing with patients who have known diabetes or unknown diabetes in a non-critical care unit. Non-critical care. So these are patients that are coming in that are ill and usually go home in two or three days, not, not, the, not the critical care units. And so whatever data that was collected, we wanted to be able to move, help move our organization toward improved glucose management. And what we want to do was something that's evidence-based. And so that's the big terminology anymore is evidence-based. So I want to give a little bit of background first. And I set this up this way because I am working on publishing an article with uh, Dr. Long's, Dr. Job's help. And so these are the topics that I'll be um, using in this, this uh, brief. So the background, I kind of want to talk about how huge this problem of diabetes is. Um, worldwide, and this is as of last year, I went to the World Health Organization and found that we have 382 million people affected worldwide by diabetes. Now this is type 1 and type 2. It did not differentiate. And you can look at the top 10 countries um, for people, of people with diabetes between the ages of 20 and 79 years of age. And this was last year. Who would have ever thought that China 
would have the largest amount of people with diabetes. That just astounded me. It just, just kind of blew me away. Um, and then the United States is third, and we're at 24, a little over 24 million worldwide affected by diabetes. The prediction is that by 2035, we're going to be looking at about 592 million. And this will be one of the largest reasons for, uh, or the, the biggest diseases out there. Uh, they predict that it'll be seventh um, in the list of, of diseases. So it is huge. In Lubbock County, we have a little over 30,000, which is about 8% of our population. And actually, the, I think the scary part is we have about 84, a little over 84,000 that are affected with prediabetes. How many know what prediabetes is? Prediabetes is that, that time you're not yet diagnosed with diabetes because your blood sugar is not yet 125 or higher. That's a fasting. Um, a normal is, is 170 to 100. So that area between normal and diabetes is called prediabetes. So if you're, your fasting is 101 to 125, that is prediabetes. So we know that those individuals with proper modifications in lifestyle can reverse that, delay it or reverse, or hopefully prevent diabetes altogether, type two. So, and the only way to know is to be tested, of course. And so we know that one in four are um, walking around who have diabetes and, and still don't yet, don't yet know that they have type two. Uh, Top one is different. They usually are presented with symptoms and that usually presents them to the emergency room because they're, it's come on quite suddenly. But type two is very subtle. And the research does say that by the time an individual is diagnosed, they've probably had this disease for 10, 15 years and they haven't known it. And by the time they're diagnosed, they usually already have some complications blood vessel or nerve damage already. So I wanted to also look at what big of a cost is this? Um, and I wanted, I kind of wanted to know, you know, looking at the whole world, um, kind of comparing the cost. And so what I found was on that same website is that um, you're looking at about $263 billion. That's in the United States alone. And that looks to be, um, that slide's a little bit hard to read. So on down in South America, they've got $268 billion. So it's a lot of money worldwide. And a lot of these costs are direct cost or indirect cost. And diabetes, especially type 2, is affecting many, many of these poor countries that don't have the technology or they don't have proper access to care. And so that's why the indirect costs are so expensive. These people can't afford the, the supplies, the, the test strips, or the insulin, or the oral medications. Um, one in five healthcare dollars is spent on diabetes. And people with diabetes are two to four times more likely to develop heart disease and kidney problems. And it is the leading cause of new cases of blindness every day. And uh, about 70% of people have some nervous system damage um, over the lifetime of that individual. And it may be that they've got nerve damage at the time that they're diagnosed. I see that quite often. And then more than 60% of non-traumatic lower limb amputations occur in people with diabetes. So pretty astounding cost. And it, it, we're in an epidemic. We, we know that. Now what I found in the literature is that the evidence is growing all the time and there is a suggestion that there's an association between hyperglycemia and poor patient outcomes in the hospital setting. Used to, I know when I worked the floor and probably Dr. Joe and, and um, Cindy, we, you know, diabetes really wasn't, we really weren't that focused on numbers or how high their readings got. We, we were treating what they came in for. But now this is becoming a huge problem and now we're learning so much about the horrible outcomes that can occur with 
uh, blood sugars that are just, you know, barely elevated or, you know, run in the 200s all the time. The standard of practice has been this for 50 years plus. And um, I'll share a story with you here at the, at the end. Uh, and I find that this is still being used in medical schools across the country in textbooks. Um, I did ask a resident a while back, it's been probably about a year ago, about how, how are y'all taught to handle hyperglycemia? And he said, sliding scale. And uh, so I, ga I gave him a copy of a, of a, a study that is very prominent in our world. And uh, so I said, well, that's caveman medicine. You, not, you might want to show this onto your professor and, and so, so that things can change. Um, this type of therapy, those of y'all that are nurses can see there's, a, there's syringes underneath the peaks. And so what happens is that we wait until a patient has high sugar, greater than 150 in most hospitals in our hospital before they do anything. So the goal is hyperglycemia. It's reactive. You're treating something that's already happened. We're not being proactive to prevent the high readings to begin with. And it's one size fits all. So you may have two patients in, you know, next door to each other and they're on the same scale. One may weigh 130, the other one may weigh 330. And for the same reading, they're gonna get the same amount of insulin. So for that person who is 330, he may be insulin resistant and his sugars may not come down, may not respond to that. Or they may come down a little bit, but then by the next reading, the next meal, they're going to spike up again. The patient that's 130, that may be too much for that insulin, I mean for that individual, and so they may experience hypoglycemia. So what the literature tells us is that this way of treating a patient in the hospital is one of the leading causes of hypo, hyperglycemia, and a uh, increased length of stay. And what I found is that this is not supported in literature but yet it's still being used. And uh, it's rarely evaluated. It's very easy for physicians to come in and say, I'll just use the sliding scale and don't bother me. You've got a way to bring it down. I'm not worried. I'm, don't bother me. And um, being, being that I, in my role, that is an ethical issue. I, 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 that just goes all over me. And um, so anyway, I'm, you know, there's, I'm not the only one. There's several that know that this needs to change, but it's going to be a slow process, and it will be changing. Uh, the problem here is that there's no basal insulin. Stacy knows what I'm talking about. Stacy does the pump training and knows what I'm talking about, so she's shaking her head. So there's nothing to, to take care of those uh, in-between meals and then all-night long readings. There's, there's no background insulin. That was supposed to be, as I was talking, that's what a patient must feel like all day is bouncing, you know, bouncing up and down. Okay, so those that are not in the medical field, let me give you some definitions. Basal insulin is a long-acting insulin that is given once or twice daily. What we try to do is mimic the pancreas. The pancreas should be giving us insulin small amounts, 24 hours a day without us having to think about it. And then when we eat a meal, that pancreas is told through a hormonal relay that we need insulin. So we're given kind of what we call a bolus of insulin. And that would be primarily if you're giving that to someone who has diabetes that needs to be given at the mealtime. Another name for that is prandial insulin, prandial mealtime. But we've got to think about not causing that blood glucose to go up, so the way to prevent that is giving a mealtime insulin. Um, it's very rapid, it goes to work, you can take it at the meal, you can take it during the meal or right after the meal. And this component, this prandial, is absent. This is the big component. I'm seeing lots more physicians giving basal and the sliding scale, but I'm, that prandial is what we're missing out on. And so that needs to be given. And the correction is what we call sliding scale. But the correction, ideally, it, it's a rapid acting insulin, um, and it can be added to the mealtime insulin together to bring that blood sugar level down. 
but um, it needs to be recalculated uh, based on, you know, if a person is having highs all day, then we go and we make a correction to that correction dose. So it's, it's really a different uh, uh, terminology than the sliding scale. Does that make sense to most of y'all? Okay. So if you're using basal bolus, and this is what uh, physiologically mimics that human pancreas, this is what is supported in literature by the American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, ACE. This is best practice. And so it's really just using our tools that we already have just differently, a little differently, using those tools better to get that into practice. And, um, and it sure makes a difference. Um, to see that in action. I would see it when we had our outpatient diabetes center, when you had patients on pump therapy or they were taking multiple daily doses of insulin. Now when they go home, that patient may say, I don't want to do all that work. And that's fine. But do, don't you want this for your family member? Don't you want this for your, your loved one, your child, your 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 parent, you know, whatever. We're already doing this in the, ch in the children's hospital. It's just not made it over to the adult side. So this, um, this really does work and it can be tweaked and according to that individual's blood sugars. So I, I wanted to give the position statement. The last part is what I just got through saying about ADA and ACE, what they support. Um, and that is the preferred method for controlling a patient's blood sugar in the hospital instead of the sliding scale. Now, up at the top, these are the goals that are recommended. Pre-meal should be generally less than 140 if we can do that without causing hypoglycemia, and a random blood sugar of a less than 180. So that's the recommended range for people who are not in critical, critical care areas. So the data suggests that, that implementing this would improve patient outcomes and reduce costs. But guess what? There's barriers, right? We know there's barriers. Now, I listed some of these up here. There's multifactorial barriers. There's not just one or two. There's, there's several. And the literature states that if you have a standardized physician or a, a, a standardized insulin order set stating basal bolus that that would help implement this into practice. Currently, most hospitals across the country still haven't done that. We've all gone electronic, and we were hoping last September that we would have this electronic, and we didn't. It's not there. So um, somebody's got to got to get that going. And um, but that's that's best practice is to have it standardized. Physicians fear hypoglycemia. How many of you nurses fear low blood sugar? But in a hospital setting, it can be easily corrected. Have you all heard of clinical inertia? That is in much of the literature that I have read. And it's one of those concepts, I guess you would call it, where physicians may know what to do, but they choose not to. So look that up clinical inertia, and I think we need to overcome clinical inertia somehow. All right, what about change in practice? Oh my goodness, that's not easy. It's not easy for nurses. It's sure not easy for physicians. So it takes me, we have to do things differently. And then lots of other factors. So what we did is we did a quantitative retrospective analysis of 185 medical records. These patients needed to have point of care glucose testing. This was not easy. I actually, I did this by myself and I did it by hand. And I had another person that, that kind of helped me, but I entered the data. And I physically took the electronic data that I had and I found my patients and I recorded what I was getting into an Excel spreadsheet. And um, I set this up using what's called a glucometrics method to analyze. And this method came from the hospital of, 
uh, it's a Society of Hospital Medicine. Down at the bottom is Goldberg, and he's, I've given you the reference at the end if anyone is interested. So this is a tool that he talks about and they use. This is from Yale, him and some other physicians. And this is the tool that they have found that probably is the most validated tool out there. And so what they do is they take the hospital stay and they look at the days, hospital days. And they take the mean of the glucose of each patient day, so it's the mean of the means, and each patient day is tagged as within goal range, and what they used was 70 to 149, and that's what I used as well. And then each day that was hypoglycemic, it didn't matter how many times they were hypoglycemic, we just wanted that one day, because all those different times can skew your data. You may have a, a low, and you've treated it, and you've gone back several times to recheck, and it's still low. So we just look at that one, as one day. And then we looked at uh, each day was tagged as hyperglycemic if that day was higher than 299. Well, I broke it down a little bit differently, and you'll see in a minute what, what I did. So that's what they use. That's what Dr. Prem Thomas uses with his glucometrics. So what, what we did is I looked at this, and you can calculate this with your spreadsheet. And I found that we were getting the mean of the patient day means was 188. So these patients were running about 188 on average. Total patient days tested were uh, 1,463. So I want to just look at the percentage of the pie chart. So out of all of those, we had 32% that were actually in the range of 70 to 149. And I actually took these off of a unit, a med search unit, looking at October, November, December of 2010. And um, uh, got that data. Uh, our patients with hypoglycemia was 7%. I don't like that at all. That's a safety issue. And then those who were higher than, than 150 were 19%. And um, those that were 151 to 299 were 42%. So we have, we, we looked at that and said, oh my goodness, uh, you know, 151 to 299 that's high. We have a 68% opportunity to improve these, these glucoses. And this, if this is occurring on this unit, it can probably occur, it's probably occurring everywhere else. So why is this important to nurses? Why? Why do you think it's important to nurses? Why is it relevant? Well, we can put that patient in a state of dehydration, uh, fluid imbalances. And we can actually cause that patient to go into DKA very quickly ourselves. Inflammation is known to occur in the arteries of those individuals who have elevated sugar. So that can lead to that, that acute MI. It can lead to a stroke. What about those patients with poor wound healing? What about that patient with sepsis? That patient who already is, has got an infection? Uh, even forming a, a venous thrombus is, is big when you think about it. Um, we've increased that patient's mortality and we've increased the length of stay. What's happening now with increased length of stay? Are we getting paid? No. We're not getting reimbursed for those people who have DRGs that are telling us they can only stay four days or three days and they're staying a week. So that's affecting our bottom line. And I, I also said earlier that the standardized insulin order sets, they are evidence-based, but they have been shown to decrease insulin errors. That's a big one. Insulin is, a, is one of those, those agents, those drugs that have a high incidence of, of error. So we have a, a critical role to play as patient advocates, do you think? I think so. And bringing this evidence to local champions. What I want to show you... Um, let me just go ahead and show you this since I'm on this. I'm going to pass this around. This is actually, I copied this or I had this printed today off of Meditech. And start down here looking at this patient's blood sugars all the way to today. Now, let me give you some background on this patient. This patient is in his early 60s, very intelligent man, very knowledgeable about diabetes. He was living up... Um, 
California, was transferred with Meditech, came to Lubbock, was going to a PCP, was giving him oral agents only. He was on three different oral agents. He's had diabetes for longer than 10 years. Well, we already know if that patient's had diabetes longer than 10 years, we've already probably depleted their beta cells. He told me that his sugars were never under 200, and she didn't know what else to do for him. And he told me he got so frustrated at that that he, he just took himself off of everything. He felt bad. He said, I'm just, I just took myself off of everything. He still continued to monitor, so he's getting 400 blood sugars. He flew somewhere, not recently, it was just very, very recently, and got a big abscess on his neck. It has gone into necrosis. So he's had sur a couple of surgeries to open all this up, drain this. He's going to need wound care as an outpatient. Um, this man, you know, we've already affected his productivity. He's lost work. He's lost wages. Um, he's got this big old, you know, thing on his head. So when he comes in, He's being seen by the residents, not a hospital. It's the residents, the tech residents. We've just allowed residents to come over. I have nothing against residents except they need help with managing blood glucose. With them. They, they just aren't taught best practice. I'm going to tell you, they're not. So they put him on Lantus. They, they start him out at 30 units. They, they put him on sliding scale in addition. Okay, the early part is Lantus. 30 units. This morning they raised it to 35 and still there's no mealtime insulin. If you look at those and you look at his meals and you see what happens the next time they test and it's high, if he had taken something for those carbohydrates, I don't think we would see readings that high. When I see this, my hair on the back of my neck stands on end and my heart rate is increasing and I just want to run over and pick up that phone and so today now what I did is and I told him I said you're probably going to go home on this rapid acting insulin you're intelligent you know carbs what you can do is you can do one unit for every 15 grams you can do that he doesn't have a PCP going to be a while before he can even get into a PCP. They didn't notify, didn't, didn't consult endocrinology. This is scaring me. This is very unethical. So he's still there today and I printed off a lot of things that I could find for him to teach him about basal bolus correction, how to calculate that. So I found out he's still there so nothing had been done about adding Prandil, so I went to the phone and I called. He tells me that they're going to send him home on Lantus only. That's it. And then expect him to follow up. And I already know what's going to happen. So, I, you know, I'm thinking, I have to be an advocate. There's no one else advocating for this man. So I go to the phone and I call the doc, very, very nice uh, resident and tell her my concerns. And, and I tell her, best practice is basal bolus correction. You've got him on two components. Can we add a prandial dose of insulin? Well, I, I think that's a great idea, but I don't know how much. Well, he knows carb counting. I'd start him out one unit for 15 grams. Let him start doing that and let him track that. And I had told him if that doesn't work, one unit for 10 grams. You can, you can do that. You can either do that or set a, a set dose of two units or three units per meal, but he would have the, the most flexibility if he got to decide how he was going to eat his carbs. Okay, okay, I, that, I agree, that, that, that sounds good. So he'll go home with Lantus and Humalog. I just felt so much better. Now, that, may, that to me is what a nurse does. You advocate for your patient. And, you know, and he's telling me that this particular physician left family practice and is now a hospitalist. So, those of y'all at the bedside, 
and get this, just get it out because I don't want to see my father who has type 2 coming in being treated that way. The man's going to come back in. And this time he may be septic and he may not survive sepsis. So that's, that's our role. That's what we can do. So in conclusion, we know that the data that I had demonstrated that there was much room for improvement. And this data was taken by Dr. Ike. Um, and we decided to do a pilot. That was in 2011 in April. That lasted about one week. Physicians didn't want to mess with it. They didn't want to have to, back then it was, we were still paper and they were having to ask for paper. There was just a lot of problems with it. So it didn't get carried through. So I think at that point my sales just, you know, had no wind left. And so anyway, uh, then in 2013, I'm sorry, 2012, 2013, the end of 2013, um, we had a lady that is a, a new VP of quality, and this is her passion to improving blood glucose management. So we've started meeting by phone all across the ministries. And that was good until the end of, of last year, and then that sort of has, fire has sort of gone out. So um, I'm kind of back at it. And I've created HealthStream now, and we are going to change policy on my end. If we can't change it on the front end with physicians, we can change it on the back end. And we can change policy and talk about Lantus. You never stop Lantus with your type twos. And how many times I hear that, that it stopped because the patient had a blood sugar of 70 and the nurse was afraid he would drop because they didn't know what Lantus is all about. So those kinds of things, and meal bolus, you know, those kinds of things we can put into policy. So even though the, infant, the evidence is there, it's slow again, but again, it, it takes one or two people to spread it out. Now, I had limitations, and that's what made me feel uneasy about writing the article. And so because I realized that I, didn't, I did not exclude patients who came in with diabetic ketoacidosis, or HHNK, which would skew the data, their blood sugars are going to come in very high, right? I didn't uh, exclude those people on steroids. So I know that there's other things that I could do. And then I didn't also know about their treatments. Were they on sliding scale alone? Were they getting some Lantus plus correction? Or were they getting all components? So I, I don't know how they were treated. And uh, so I do already have a future study planned. I've already got it all mapped out on, on my Excel. And that's kind of what I want to look at taking into these. I want to you know, do more exclusions and inclusion criteria. And uh, again, we, we're going to be looking at changing our policy. I administ I'm over the uh, kind of the administrator, I guess you could say, of policy. So uh, we're going to be hitting this this subject hard and heavy. So that concludes my presentation. Here are my references. I hope you all have enjoyed this and gotten something out of it. And now we'll have uh, Dr. Littlefield coming over and being our oops, facilitator. First of all, thank you, Elaine. That was fantastic. Oh, you're welcome. Um, that was wonderful. And I think one of the things that stood out to me, which I'm sure you guys saw as well, but the huge number of people that you will potentially be able to impact by um, implementing something like this. With 8.3% of our population, that's just a large number of folks that you really have the uh, the ability to positively impact so thank you and I just wanted to start too I'm coming at this from a perspective of um, an exercise physiologist but I've also had type 1 diabetes since I was four and so um, very personal as well um, so I may talk about that a little bit in a minute but um, I love that you brought out that with the insulin pump we know and we have data that outside of the hospital that's the best way to control sugars 
that's the basal bolus setup. And so it's fascinating that mm -hmm. the older methods are still being employed in an inpatient setting. So I thought that was a great point. Um, another thing that stuck out to me is you think about the challenges of blood glucose management from the standpoint of the patient and the provider. So when somebody comes into the hospital, you know, one of the things we talk about, about with exercise a lot is the hormonal response to exercise and how much that can mess up your sugars. I will think about all the stress hormones associated with being sick, with not sleeping. So blood sugar control is a bear, even for the people who are diligent and you know working hard to, to do it. So having a proper program in place like this, even with that being done, it's still gonna be hard. So to think that we're still so far back with implementing the right type of treatment is a little bit scary. Um, I had one thing I wanted to say too. I thought, I didn't realize that they were treating, for instance, people of the same weight with a similar scale. Um, so I just, I know it's, this is probably incredibly uncommon, but I had a situation a few months ago where I had run seven miles one morning and then got sick later in the day. And I didn't have to go to the hospital, but I thought I might have to go. Can you imagine treating a person who had run, you know, or done some type of strenuous exercise hours before with a high dose of insulin? Because we know that exercise improves insulin sensitivity for up to 72 hours after you do it. And so to me, you know, that kind of highlight of diabetes management is individuality, right? I mean, taking the patient into consideration, you know, what have your last two days been like, et cetera. So I appreciated you pointing that out. But um, I thought probably the best thing about what you said that was great is you guys are teaching people in this setting. You're teaching the patient the best way to monitor sugars, you know, with that basal bolus situation. So for somebody who's a new diabetic or for somebody who's maybe not been exposed to the insulins and such, I think that's really powerful that you have the opportunity while they're there in the hospital to kind of teach them about the most current guidelines as far as di diabetes control. Um, also, to advocate for themselves, I know that's so hard, but that's what you're teaching them to do as well. I thought that was... That was just so great. Um, the last thing, I think that within the last, probably is it 25 years that Lantus no vlog had become available? You may know. Uh, Lantus, uh, they're, they're both, it, actually it's probably close to 15, Okay. maybe 15 years, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, within the last right. couple of decades, right. there have been some substantial yes. changes in the types of insulins that are available for patients. And I think that, you know, that may be a problem for physicians. They're operating under kind of an older yes. mentality. Yes. And it's they're so different now. They're so different. Yes. I don't even know how to how to say it correctly, but that may be something too that helps yes. them, I see. Yes, yes. I think you're totally right. Is that these they haven't been out all that long. And so there's probably a knowledge deficit with physicians, especially if they're they're not keeping up with uh, with you know reading journals and that sort of thing. Um, but you know we we've got the tools now where we didn't have. Um, I can think back 25 years ago we didn't have the tools that we have today with with these new insulins. So the new analogs have really made it um, so much better for our patients. Easier to prevent mm -hmm. hypoglycemia. Oh yes, I mean, yes. So a lot, a right. lot of benefits right. there. That's all I had. That was thank you. Thank, thank you, thank so you, much. thank you for being here. I appreciate you very much. Questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Could you talk a little bit about, we talk about the resistance to the change and you talk about fear of hypoglycemic attacks. You know, on your graph it showed it was 7% of the actual outcome. Yes. Do you know why we fear the hypoglycemia more than we, the hyperglycemia, which has shown to cause horrible complications with our patients as well? Is it just the fact of the passing out and it seems like a crisis situation, or is there more depth to it than that? You want to address that? I'd love to, thank you. I, I think coming from someone who lives it every day would be good. Um, it's terrifying. I mean, it's absolutely terrifying to be, um, 
shaky and discombobulated, not being able to think straight. Um, you know, I've had experiences as a child where, you know, you, fit, you can't take care of yourself. You can't fix the problem. It is um, probably the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my life. And it's interesting, too, because that's, um, you know, we know that's one of the greatest barriers to control, too, is people are so mm -hmm. afraid of low blood sugar that they're more apt to let it run high. And I could, that's very difficult. Just the, the, the fear of it is, is terrifying. Well, it seems that from your talk, the physicians are, uh, want to avoid that as well. From a personal perspective, how you feel physically when you're hypoglycemic is horrible. But it also, from your research that you did in the literature, Elaine, it seemed that the physicians really yes. want to avoid that as well. Yes. They don't want to risk that, no. so they don't want to do right. the cranial. Right. Yeah. and change the way exactly. that they manage. Exactly. But the good the thing about it is too is is again, you know, the NPH and the regular are very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And so you would see more hypoglycemia when you use those old insulins. But the newer ones, the whole reason that they're that they were so po that, that that they are so popular is that the way that they are designed is that they cause less problems with hypoglycemia. And so they don't hang around. You know, the, the Novolog, all of the analogs don't hang around like the R does. You know, the R may hang around six, eight hours and, or longer. And the Novologs, or not the Novologs, but the analogs hang around, what, three or four hours, maybe three hours max, something like It just depends on the individual. So that, that, that chance is lessened. But I think they're thinking of the old days of, you know, and we used to have horrible reactions when N and R were used. People would drop down, you know, in the 20s, or the patient would be unconscious. And you know, then it's time taking, you know, from the from the nurse's standpoint, going in and giving the D50 and getting that patient back up. And so I think there's that just that fear. It is fearful. It is fearful. Yes. It's also it's easier to bring someone down in a gradual manner, it's much harder to bring someone up in, in an efficient time frame. And so I think physicians would rather have someone run high than do that. But again, it's just lack of knowledge on the analog insulins that are not gonna be in the body so long. I'm a big advocate of overchecking one's sugar, so I think that's one thing too that's sometimes overlooked is you, just, you have to check it more, you know, when you're in that situation. So, so some of that could probably be avoided. Well, I'll just add, <clears throat> my father's type 1 diabetic, so I, and I grew up kind of in the old regime of the sliding scale and the, just the rapid drops and highs and lows. And just thinking of it as a, as a child, a father, the, the, the lows terrified me. The, the highs, I had a basic understanding of the future dangers of highs with the complications. But the lows had immediate acute Yes. Dangers that really scare not I'm sure the individual but also the family and the surrounding caregivers. It's terrifying. Right. And people have lost lives, you know, especially driving and gotten so low that, you know, they lost their life or they've taken the life of someone else. So it, it's critical to, to be too low. Um, I remember walking in one day, we had a dietitian in our center. She was supposed to speak that day at lunch, and she was dressed up, and when I walked in, she literally was wet from her head down. Her clothes were wet, and um, one of the other nurses was trying to keep her from losing consciousness. She had all these sugar was open, and she had dumped it in juice, and was trying to get her to drink it, and um, I mean, we couldn't, we were getting 20s and 30s on our meter, and she wasn't coming up and we didn't have glucagon where we were. We weren't allowed to have it. Can you believe that? So we had to call 911, and they had to take her in. No, they didn't take her in. They gave her some, um, some glucose IV and got it back up. But she felt wiped out the rest of the day, just totally wiped out, um, you know. So it, is, it was scary for us, um, you know, not knowing what that outcome might be. And um, I had a, another client that, uh, is this off the record? Is this turned off? No. 
Okay, well, anyway, I, I, had, a, I had a patient that uh, chose to drink excessively during the holidays, was, was wearing an insulin pump, and um, long story short, she's got severe brain damage. She survived. Uh, she was found, and, um, but she's unable to take care of herself because that liver could not metabolize, give her glucose because it was having to metabolize the alcohol. So if it gets low enough and it stays low enough, I don't know what the time limit is, but she has uh, extensive brain damage from that. So it is scary, uh huh? Do you know if your article giving to the resident did it have any effect? Do you know? I don't that? think so. <laughs> I don't because of what I saw today. You know, um, I don't. I, I, I just bum fuzzles me, and I know that um, one of the PhD who's doing research in Top One there is doing a lot of the teaching to the residents. So uh, I'm not sure if it's all Top One or if it's if any of it's Top Two related, but. They definitely need, um, and I, I can always tell when I've got the residents there that I'm going to have to call because they just don't get it. They just, um, you know, and it's not their fault. But um, if, you, if you look at that and then if this patient had come back and it, this patient, like if it stayed and had been on, I could see the difference by just adding, you know, two or three units at mealtimes, so what that next blood sugar would be. It, it probably won't be perfect because he's still dealing with this, this infection, but I think it would be, it'd be better. Uh-huh. Well, first of all, thank you both. That was a fantastic um, presentation. And, um, for the courageous work you're doing, and the courageous life you're living, and just the difference that you're making. But um, I'm wondering if you can help you know, those of us that maybe, um, you know, were educated long ago mm -hmm. on how to understand this is really for both of you. I think so often, you know, especially for us folks that have been around for a long time, we were educated in a time where we were just taught to, you know, to be strong advocates for patients, but sometimes um, we don't know how to empower the patient in, in the language that we use and the communication that we use, and I'm I'm so thankful that that paradigm is shifting, so that really we're we're, we're now we see it's the patient is in the driver's seat. We're just there to cheer them on and empower them. But um, for both of you and, and uh, Dr. Littlefield, you may especially may have some ideas on this. But what would you say to nurses? How can we best do that in the way we approach a patient that we're giving education and not being in a telling mode and yet they need information uh, how can we how, how do we need to change our practice as nurses so that we can convey that respect and empowerment to patients you know when we're when we're giving them education because i think there's a deficit in our understanding of how to do that well uh, what I've been dealing with lately is, is telling patients that, you know, years back and even up till now, we've had a different model of care where you, you were told to do something by your physician. But that model is changing, and that patient now is needing to be in the center of that, making those decisions. You've got people out here helping, but totally, it's, your, it's up to you. And... You know, there are some cultures that will probably, you'll never impact that, but um, there just needs to be more of that. And, and we do, a, I think that's where it's lacking, is, is empowering folks. Now, technology has made it better because patients now are, that have, that, that have uh, a lot of self-efficacy uh, about them, they will search the, the research themselves online how many of us do that? I do that. Um, but our patients don't have that same education many times or that same desire. And, and that's hard. You know, I, I talked to a man today and they're in their 40s and they don't own a computer. They don't have an internet. You know, so I'm thinking, how do you get your information? You know, you're not just going to get it from the news. And so sometimes they have to wait till something bad happens before they feel empowered. Um, but that that needs to shift, and I'm not sure how. Um, one one technique or one new thing that's coming up is called nurse coaching. That is, 
um, helping patients to um, see that they've got the answers within them, but using the nurse coaching, the techniques, or whatever you want to call it, health coaching, helps that patient to see that they have, they are very capable. It's just they don't know that yet. They haven't discovered that about themselves yet. And so it's through motivational interviewing and listening. Most nurses at the bedside don't have time to listen and use those skills at the bedside because they're too busy being task oriented. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. this is somewhat related to uh, that question, but if you had to choose one level where you could bring about the quickest change in attitude and knowledge about this, where would that be? Would it be medical schools, nursing, patient, physicians practicing? Where would that be? Where would it be? Mm -hmm. If you had to pick target one to begin with. To target, you mean the... the, the um, to bring this knowledge to so that it would have an impact. The providers, the different providers, or, or what do you, or the school of thoughts, or I don't guess I'm understanding what you're asking. Well, the, the, you've got doctors, medical students in medical schools, you have patients, you have nurses, hospitalists. What area could more quickly bring about what you're presenting here? Bring it into practice? Um, that's a good question. I think I think nurses are great place to start um, but you've got to get yourself educated you've got to know where to search the literature um, you know I think having a higher education having a high, like a master's you know where to search the literature you know how to search even with a bachelor's you can search and then bringing what you've learned to the forefront and that's kind of a change in culture we haven't had that before this is all being driven and it's, it's evidence-based practice. And so many physicians cannot possibly keep up with, especially internal medicine, with everything out there that's coming out, coming out that's just, you know, uh, it, it's just been thrown at them. And so um, luckily I'm in a specialty area where I can do this. Not everyone can. And so, um, but nurses have a great opportunity um, because we know kind of where to search and go about searching, but we have to take the action and take it forward uh, and not keep it to ourselves, which we, we're bad about doing that too, is keeping that knowledge to ourselves and not spreading that out. But I don't know if that answers your question because, you know, med students you would think, but, you know, they're busy. Um, everybody's so busy and... Um, I don't know. Do y'all have answers? Do y'all have any any answers to that to the question? Elaine, I, I think your your strategy of um, working policy is really brilliant. Um, you know, if you can make changes in nursing policy and protocol, you know, it, nurses are eighty percent of the workforce in a hospital. Right. So if you can, since you're you, you know you're you're seeing that it's slow working it through the medical model. Um, I think that's a brilliant strategy. What aspects of nursing policy could be changed that would empower the nurse and actually even hold them accountable for evidence-based implementation of standardized knowledge that we know exists? I agree and I think, you know, I think back to when I had Griffin in the hospital and by golly, I wasn't going to let a doctor tell me how much, you know, insulin to take. So I think the patient education side of it is also huge because when they really understand why they're doing what they're doing, they're they're going to let them know themselves. You know, this yeah. is this is how we're you know approaching this. Um, so I think those things going together are very powerful. Right, but the patients got to have that knowledge. Exactly. You've got the knowledge. Not not everyone mm -hmm. does. You've got the knowledge and then you know how to you know how your body works. Mm -hmm. You know, and so but it's it's getting that knowledge to that patient and getting them interested enough to do their own research, their own homework. So and that's not easy. So how much resistance would nurses 
if they're educated in this area. Because I'm, I guess you're limited in what you can do. So you have the knowledge, you know this is what's best for the patient, but who has the ultimate call? The physician? <coughs> yes. Um, but that's what we're all about. I mean, if, if you've got the knowledge and you, you, you know, uh, we're taught to pick up the phone and call that physician and not, not be fearful of what that physician may say. You've got to try. Um, and that's the only, you know, and you can start imparting that knowledge. This is best practice. Or getting the articles out to those physicians, you know. Um, that's, that, that works to some extent. But that, it, it is, it's just difficult to change. Um, and even though you, you provide maybe the information, there's still that attitude. I think there's attitudes that have to change. And that's a big thing is many physicians still don't want to be told how to practice medicine. They'll tell you that. And I've had them tell me, I know how to practice medicine. I've been, I don't see MD behind your name. Well, nope, but I can show you the evidence. Yes, sir. I would add to that too. I'm a physical therapist. And so I know that we're somewhat bound by a physician's prescription and order. However, we do have our own license that we're accountable to and, and, and we are liable to do no harm to patients. And if we have that knowledge, you know, we have that responsibility to, to do what we can, like you say, to advocate. For the, for the patient in the most respectful way we can possibly do that. But it, it does create a, a dilemma and a conflict on occasion when you run across a situation like this where you have obtained knowledge that perhaps the physician hasn't. But that's the conflict that you have to advocate. Exactly. And I have to tell you, I feel that I feel conflicted all the time about what to do. But I have to think about what's ethical, and I have to think about my own self. Can I can I go to bed tonight and be glad about what I did or didn't do and live with that? You know, um, and I, I have I have told patients not. I have to be careful how I say it if they ask me. Um, you know about certain physician. And I don't, maybe don't go into a lot of detail, I'll just shake my head and body language tells a lot. But <laughs> I think we owe that to our patients. Just because somebody's got MD after their name doesn't mean that they have their best interest at heart. So I think it's, it's you know, you're right. And I, you know, I've, I've shown many patients this is best practice. This is best practice. This is what should be happening. It's not happening. We're not there yet, but this is best practice. Anything else? Fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.